I feel like continuing with John here. Um, we didn't really finish John. I just read the last few verses. Uh, he says in 54, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say he is your God. These people believe that God is their God, and he just told them the devil is your God. Is it because they were knowingly serving the devil? No, it's because they are born according to the flesh, and they must be born again. They have to be terminated, and this is really, uh, in a way, the message of the cross. Again, if you give the flesh a pass in the service to God, you bring strange fire on the altar, and you pollute the things of God. And you actually, everything you do, really strengthens the enemy's work against the church. Um, we have to see, before we can really serve the Lord effectively, we have to see what the flesh is. There's nothing we can do about the flesh. But we've got to come to a place where we learn that the flesh is in opposition to God and had to go to the cross. That will change what we say and what we minister and what we approve of. The thing is, is if you are a messenger of the cross, you will not approve of everything else that everybody's approving of. And as a result, you'll eventually be at odds with a lot of people. Um, and there's plenty of saved people that end up being an enemy of the cross. They're friends for the gospel's sake, but when it comes to the message of the cross, they just can't see it. They really believe that they're doing great, you know. Some of them aren't saved because they think they're justified by works. Some of them are saved but think they're sanctified by works and are trying to perfect themselves according to the flesh and putting burdens on people and they're building with wood, hay, and stubble. Um, and the more they the more they build with wood, hay, and stubble, the more they strengthen the flesh. And the mind of the flesh is enmity against God. The carnal mind cannot be subject to God. It will be in opposition to his word. It will be in opposition to the truth. So there are a lot of saved people that can be temporarily used by the enemy uh, to oppose truth. You know, all of us at any point. I remember when I got saved, I thought that I was special. So God had called me and that meant that God was going to use me to do something great. And I was taught that in the charismatic church and that he was going to use my gifts to do some supernatural thing. And we had all kinds of megalomaniac dreams about having a ministry that was big, you know, sweeping the whole earth. And I remember you couldn't talk to a person in that church that had a coffee house that wasn't going to have a coffee house chain that covered the whole earth. And that every time anybody went into their coffee houses, they would just be struck by the glory of God and fall out, you know. That is delusions of grandeur from an unchecked flesh. Uh, and that is what we saw so much in the charismatic church was that everybody was going to launch some big crusade and sweep the earth, you know. Why? Be because their flesh, they were not told that their flesh needed to go to the cross. They were told that their flesh was going to be used to serve God. And... Uh, what was praised and honored in that camp was actually things God despised. The things that are honorable to God are the things are honorable to man. God despises. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I just remember, uh, well, everybody was so ambitious and they were all wolves. The wolfishness and the ambition go together. And uh, many of them were saved. Okay. They believed the correct gospel for justification, but they didn't understand the place of the flesh. And so as a result, the flesh was unfettered in its use for God, so to speak. And it was used by the devil. It was more, there was more demonic activity in that place, uh, oppression in those circles, strife, earthly, sensual, and demonic wisdom, backbiting, gossip, uh, by all these supposedly godly people and it's because they weren't they didn't know that their flesh needed to go to the cross they were trying to use it to serve god and in galatians it says if you sow to the flesh you'll from the flesh reap corruption and he's talking about the religious flesh there if you keep trying to perfect the flesh 
instead of assigning it to the cross and saying, I'm crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I got to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you don't have that, you are going to uh, be sowing to the flesh, strengthening the flesh, and then reaping corruption from the flesh. And eventually the whole church was just full of corruption. And then there were big problems that came in, sin and all kinds of stuff. It starts out with envy and pride and provoking one another, ends up biting and devouring one another, and on the way there's all kinds of demonic stuff because the flesh is not put in its place. And that is not a matter of beating your flesh or trying to abstain from certain things to weaken the desires of the flesh. No, it is a matter of seeing what the flesh is and reckoning on what the Bible says about it. God does not have a demand on me. I must enter into rest. God wants Christ to be manifested in me. And my flesh is in the way, especially my religious flesh. And that's what Jesus was dealing with here with these Pharisees. They thought they were sons of Abraham genetically, which they were. Um, and they thought they served God, but they were actually serving the devil. How does he know? Because they want to kill him. The hatred in their heart manifested who their God was. Um, so he said, uh, it is my father that honors me of whom you say he is your God. You've not known him, but I know him. And I should say, I know him not. I would be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not fifty years old. Have you seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Barely, I, barely, I say to you, there, uh, before Abraham was, I am. And Chuck Missler always said, This is where they underline your Bible for you. <laughs> In case you missed the implication of what he said, they underline the Bible by saying, uh, They took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. They were going to stone him for blasphemy because he said, I am. And when he said before Abraham was, I am, he's telling them that he was the voice at the burning bush when Moses turned aside and there was a bush that wasn't consumed made of acacia wood. Acacia wood is a type of the flesh, the cursed flesh. It was, uh, I think the thorns were made from acacia wood that crowned Jesus. Uh, acacia would also, I think, uh, the Ark of the Covenant um, was made of acacia wood, which signifies the humanity of Jesus, right? But the fact that it was uh, burning with fire but not consumed struck Moses. And he's like, what is this? This bush isn't burning out. There's a fire there. And that is a picture of grace, that the way God works is to manifest Christ. Not consume your flesh and use your flesh as the fuel. That fire was burning on its own. It didn't need the thorn bush to provide it fuel. So the thorn bush was just sitting there and really became a lampstand to hold the fire without being consumed. And that's what we are. Um, and that's where Moses was called. And he said, well, who should, I, who should I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am. So this is... Jesus saying, even before Abraham, I am. I'm, I am. <laughs> this is a direct claim to deity. And incidentally, Jesus said in John 1, no one has ever seen the Father. Only the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father has declared him. And that is true throughout the whole Bible. Every time you see God manifested, it's actually not the Father, but the Son. Jesus Christ was the one who walked in the garden with Adam. Jesus Christ is the word that flung forth the universe. He is the one in whom everything was made and by whom everything was made and through whom everything was made and everything is held together in him. He is the light. Uh, he is the framer of worlds. And he is the one that appeared. No one has ever seen the Father. Only the begotten, only begotten Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. And that is true of all time. Now, eventually, when we are in eternity, we apparently will behold the Father. And he's not something separate from Jesus. Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Jesus. It's a mystery. There's a coherence. 
uh, the triune God, the three, one God. And this God incarnated himself in the Son and is standing there telling the Pharisees that they don't know him, they serve the devil, their flesh is condemned, needs to be crucified, and then he points them back to the burning bush, which is how we serve God. Not based on our ability, not based on us providing any fuel to that fire. We're just a thorn bush. But the fire burns and doesn't consume us. And that's what we are. If you're going to serve God, that's what you need to be. And that is after 40 years, after Moses had killed an Egyptian trying to take matters into his own hands. He thinks he's going to save Israel by the strength of his own flesh. He kills an Egyptian and then he has to flee. And he's gone on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years being bottomed out. All of his confidence was stripped. He had been trained in Pharaoh's household. He knew how to fight. He knew all the mysteries of Egypt. He was raised as a son and an heir. He was a brother to the Pharaoh. Uh, and yet he had to be bottomed out. By the time God gets to him 40 years later, he's like, I can't even speak. You know, I stutter and I, I'm not the one you should send. All of his confidence was gone. That's the mark of someone who has seen what the flesh is and been dealt with to see that the flesh is not useful to God. I'm just a thorn bush. That thorn bush was a picture of Moses and the fire was a picture of Christ. And really the thorn, the bush was also a picture of Christ in his humanity because he didn't live by the power of the flesh. He lived by the power of the spirit. And that's what he wants for us. But we have to see that this does apply to us. That if we think we know God and we think we serve God, and yet we have not reckoned that our flesh is really for the devil <laughs> and the law of sin dwells in it and we were children of wrath by nature and we think that we were just fine and then God called us and now we just get to use, be used by God, we're like Moses before the 40 years. We might strike an Egyptian, but we're not going to have any victory for God. And, uh, yeah, you know, the, so the flesh has to be reckoned dead. We just, this is just, this is not, again, beating our flesh and subduing our flesh ourselves. This is a reckoning. Reckon yourself dead. It means I understand what God is telling me about the flesh. It doesn't offend me anymore. I remember... When I first read Watchman Nee years ago, it offended me. He was talking about the cross, and that just offended me. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting his ministry, but I just remember he was one of the first ones that really talked about this that I had read. And at the time, I was puffed up in my religious flesh. I thought I was going to do something great for God. That message was offensive. And I've met so many that become offended by the message of the cross. No, I'm a servant of God. What are you talking about? I'm going to do great things for God, and I have been doing great things for God. And then eventually they end up hating you. <laughs> you know. So the flesh, if it's a loud opportunity, will serve the devil. And if you don't believe me, just sow to it for a while and watch what happens. How do you sow to it? Try to perfect yourself by religious righteousness. Try to be a servant of God without reckoning it dead, without viewing what it is without accepting the full truth of redemption and why Jesus had to die and what does it mean that we were crucified with him? Why did he have to terminate us if we were fine? Couldn't he just given us a law that we could be righteous by following the commandments? No, if righteousness were to come by the law, Christ died in vain. Nope, he had to crucify us. He terminated the Adamic human race. He's not using it. He's calling us out of it, and he's starting something new in our spirit. That is what he's wanting. He's wanting the living water to come out. Until the living water comes out, there's no service to God. And for that, you have to be thirsty enough to come to him and drink. And if you come and drink, he's going to show you the full spectrum of truth to reveal not only who God is, but who you are. And you need to be able to steep, still keep coming boldly to the throne of grace, even though he starts to show you that in your flesh dwells no good thing. And a lot of people get really 
down because the Lord will bring them through 10 years of showing them what's in their flesh. Hey, 10 years is better than 40. Moses had 40 years, you know. Uh, Jacob had years and years and years. Transformation takes a really long time. Transformation to take us out of the strength of the flesh, which is the true circumcision. We are the true circumcision, right, who have no confidence in the flesh. We serve by the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus. Where did that come from? It came from God enlightening us to see what we really are. And it's not just words that tell us this. It's our situation and our failure and the relationships we're in and the fact that we start to realize, oh, I'm not just sinning against God. I'm also damaging people. I'm damaging these relationships and I'm hurting people, you know, and we all do. Uh, but we're blind to it until the Lord enlightens us. And that sometimes takes many years. So there is a place in the Christian life for many years of failure while you're just clinging by faith to the gospel. And you finally come to a place where you say, Oh, wretched man, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now you start to understand the message of the cross. Oh, I am crucified with Christ. I had to die to the law. I threw the law died to the law so that I might live unto God. I'm crucified with Christ. And now it's got to be Christ in me. Well, how is that? How's that happen? I live by faith in the Son of God. I got my eyes off all my ambitions. I used to think the Christian life was you get saved and then you go figure out what you can do for God. I got emptied out of all my ambitions and finally thought it got to a point where it's like, I just hope I'm saved. <laughs> I would just be so satisfied if I could have assurance in my heart that there's really no condemnation and that I have peace with God. Because look at me. God can never use me, you know. And that's where I reached about five years ago. I just bottomed out and bottomed out and bottomed out. And then all my hopes were dashed. I no longer had a hope of serving God. It didn't even occur to me to serve God. I was seeking God strictly for the peace. I just needed peace with God. I don't care if I ever do anything. I don't care if anyone ever accepts me. Lord, I just want you. I'm hungry and thirsty for you. Then he began to fill me with little streams of water and refresh my soul. Um, and every one of us has to go through this or we are an enemy of the cross. We are an enemy of the cross even when we get saved. Our God is our appetites, you know. We, we just want to do something great because we think we're great. And that's probably why God saved me, because I'm so great. No. Christ is great. And God is interested in Christ being manifested. You're a thorn bush. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. I didn't know where I was going to go with this. I thought I was going to get into John 9, but um, I think I'm going to leave it here. Have a good day.